Okay, so it's a pleasure to welcome back one of the former graduate students, so, so Kelly Yancey, yeah. graduated in 2013. Mm -hmm. right? That's right. Mm -hmm. You're your advisor with Joe Rosenblatt. Yeah. And now Kelly is at the Institute for Defense Analysis, and she's going to tell us about self-similar interval exchange transformations. That's right. Okay. So are we good here? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that's really scary. I walked into the room and they had me a microphone. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I hope that the talk's okay. <laughs> Somehow it's a uh, bigger audience is a little more intimidating. Um, but yeah, so it's really good to be back. Um, actually, I come back once a year, basically. Um, so I've been back a lot because I'm on the, or I was on the math advisory board. This is my first year off the board. So now I'm back for something a little more fun, which is it's great for the reunion. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, self-similar interval exchange transformations because um, it seems like that fit into the gear seminar a little bit better than some of the uh, stuff I'm doing right now. So this was published last year, so it's about a year, um, a year old. Okay, so I think uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give some motivation first, um, and we're going to talk about uh, Sarnak's conjecture a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about minimal self-joinings and then interval exchange transformations, and then a little bit of substitutions and dynamical systems. So there's a little bit of everything. So if you have questions, please ask me. Okay. So motivation. And I was, as I was walking around, I was reminded that there are bells here. So I <laughs> will not go over time. <laughs> All right. Um, so first, we're going to start out uh, with minimal self-joinings. All right. So we're going to call minimal self-joinings MSJ for short. All right, just so I don't have to write it down every time. And why would we study minimal self-joinings? Right, well, there's lots of reasons. Um, one is that they're interesting in and of themselves. A lot of people just study joinings of systems by themselves. You're going to tell us what they are. I will tell you what they are. Yep. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> you, you don't know? <laughs> um, and the second thing um, is another reason to study them. And this is a theorem by Sarnak. Okay, that says, if a system has minimal self-joinings, and again, I will tell you what all this means, and it's uniquely ergodic, then it satisfies Sarnak's conjecture. Okay, I will tell you what all this is, but the fact that this is a big conjecture um, should say, hey, maybe these things are interesting to study, okay? All right, and I'll, again, I'll tell you what they are a little bit towards the middle of the talk because the definition is a little bit more hairy, okay? All right, so away from this, um, let's go to our next conjecture and discuss it a little bit. So for this, we need the, the Mobius function, which maybe you've seen before. Okay, and this is our Mobius function. All right, so we're going to call it uh, mu sub n, um, and I apologize, mu will be the Mobius function and a measure, but it should be completely clear um, what each of those are. So mu sub n can be three things. It can be one if n is one. It's zero if n is square free. Okay. And it's minus one to the t if n is t distinct primes. So n is a product of t distinct primes. This chalk's a little squeaky. All right, so that's the Mobius function. You've probably, like I said, probably seen it before. Just uh, for example, well, mu sub 1, well, that's just 1, right? Um, mu sub 2, well, that's going to be minus 1, right? Mu sub 3 is minus 1. Mu sub 4 is 0, and on and on and on, right? So a question is, is this random, this sequence, all right? It's a big question. We don't know the answer to that, all right? And I say we. I mean, lots of people much smarter than me don't know the answer to that, all right? So is this sequence a random sequence? Okay. Let me tell you two facts about the sequence. Just if you're not already interested in it, you should be after this, okay? So two facts. The first one is that if you look at the sum 
uh, from n, little n less than or equal to n of mu sub n. If this is equal to little o of n, if you have this inequality here, this is equivalent to the prime number theorem. Okay, so big important thing, right? Okay, uh, the second thing, on my next page. Okay, so now we have an epsilon. So for epsilon greater than zero, if we have that the sum of mu sub n um, is equal to big O of n to the one half plus epsilon, if we have that, this is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. I'm confused. Why is neo 4 0? Yeah. I think it's supposed to say not squared. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry. Okay. 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 Yes. Square. That's a typo. <laughs> I was like, because it's two square? <laughs> yeah, sorry, here. <laughs> yes, sorry, my bad. <laughs> um, right. Um, so this is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. So this is clearly a very important sequence to study. All right. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, what's called the Mobius randomness law, and I'll tell you what that is, um, which is going to lead us into our next conjecture about studying the sequence and studying things that correlate with it. Okay. Okay, so the Mobius randomness law says that the function mu does not, does not correlate okay, with any function of low complexity. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what it means to be correlated next. But this is what the law says. All right, this is what we think is going to happen. Okay, so um, what does this correlation type thing mean? Well, if you have a function f, and we'll say that f is bounded and not sparsely supported, okay, then by orthogonal, we mean that the sum of mu sub n times f of n is equal to little o of n. This is what we mean by orthogonality. Okay? And orthogonality says that you do not correlate. All right. So this means you do not correlate. So one function does not approximate the other. Okay. All right. And by low complexity, um, we're going to get into entropy a little bit. That's what we'll mean by complexity. Okay. All right, so finally, on to Sarnak's conjecture. Okay. This is a, one of those governing laws that nobody has proved. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Mm. Yeah, that's why I'm, it's, it's, not called, it's not called a theorem. <laughs> it's one of those laws that seems to be right. Yeah. Um, and so our next conjecture is basically about this exactly. Yeah. Okay. So to describe the conjecture, um, these functions here are going to come from dynamical systems. All right. So these are going to be generated by flows and then... Um, so we'll put what up what I mean by a flow, and then we'll say what the conjecture is. And what I mean by flow is the old topological dynamics version of flow, not a flow in a manifold or something like that. So we'll call xt a flow, okay? Um, if x is a compact metric space. Okay. And uh, t goes from x to x is continuous. Okay, that's what we mean by a flow here. Okay, and we're going to think of, like I said, we're going to think of this function f of n as coming from a flow. All right, 
And when we say f of n comes from a flow, or comes from maybe the flow f, what that means is that uh, for any x and a function that's continuous, what we have is that f of n is, some, is g evaluated at some orbit. So again, we take a point and a continuous function, and we look at the orbit of that point, evaluate it under g, and we'll say that's f of n. Okay? So this is what we mean by the function coming from a flow. Okay. All right. And like I said before, um, by complexity, I'm going to mean topological entropy. Okay? And I do not, just like everybody else, I do not want to define um, topological entropy, uh, but know that it measures the growth rate, the exponential growth rate of distinct orbits um, in your system. Okay. So by low complexity, we mean entropy zero. Okay. All right. So another, one more definition. So our flow is deterministic. if the topological entropy is zero. Okay. So that's a deterministic flow. So what does the conjecture say? Okay. Well, it says that the function mu is disjoint from any deterministic flow. F. Okay. So that is back to this law, right? Just making it a little more precise. Disjoint means orthogonal. Disjoint and or disjoint means orthogonal. Yes, thank you. Okay. So if you have you have the function mu, which is your Mobius function, any um, function that's coming from um, a flow that has topological entropy zero does not approximate the Mobius function. So that's what that means. They're completely, they're disjoint. Okay. And I can write it um, in limit notation if you prefer. Um, f of n. And this is for every f that's coming from the flow. So that's what that means. All right. And what I want to do next before we move on to the next section with interval exchange maps, because that was in the title, um, is I want to tell you there are lots of known cases of flows that fit this, but it's not completely solved. All right, so I'll tell you a couple of known cases, and then we'll go into IETs. All right. Um, hmm? How hard is it to be disjoint from deterministic flows? Do they fill up the space of so there are lots and lots of functions that we have no idea, big, large classes of functions where there's no clue as to what happens. Um, so let me give you two examples, and then I think that'll better answer your question. I should also say that um, I am no expert on Sarnak's conjecture. I'll also put that out there. Um, because when I was working on this project, um, I was doing IETs for their own sake, and then kind of creeping into minimal self-joinings because there was some cool stuff going on there. And I was presenting some of these results at Princeton. And Sarnak came to me and was like, oh my goodness, you're talking about minimal self-joinings and something that's uniquely ergodic. This satisfies my conjecture. So this is like a roundabout motivation for uh, why I was doing it. <laughs> but he was very excited. Anytime we get new flows that satisfy his conjecture, it's exciting. All right. So just two known cases. There are many more, but here are two. Okay. Uh, one are rotations. So if our flow is coming from a rotation on a circle, so we have our circle, and we have our uh, rotation. OK. 
Okay, um, this was proved by uh, Vinogradov and Davenport in 37, so a while ago, in different notation. Okay, uh, the second one is a little more recent from 2013. Here, our flow um, XT is going to so, so they proved that it's disjoint from. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So known case. Sorry. By known cases, I mean known cases of flows that satisfy the conjecture. Yeah. Okay. So rotations are, you know, wonderful, nice and simple. Um, the second class of functions are rank one transformations. So this is where x t is rank one, and with certain conditions. And this is by uh, Bourgain in 2013. Okay, so I don't want to uh, say too much. Um, maybe you know what a rank one transformation is, maybe you don't. Um, it's something that can be thought of via cutting and stacking. So there's this tower construction, there's a special way of constructing these transformations. And rank one is a very large class of transformations. However, these are rank one transformations that satisfy very particular conditions on the way that you do your cutting and stacking. All right, um, but this is a, a fairly big class, not like generically big, but pretty big class. Um, you can think of them like that. Um, yes, sorry, these are homeomorphisms, and they're all continuous, right? Um, if you think about them in the symbolic setting. So this will be a little tricky when I talk about IETs as well, because if you just look at something like this, it has finitely many discontinuities. But you can think about it symbolically, in which case it's continuous, and now a will hold me more. Yeah. OK. All right, so these are our two known places. Um, Green and Tau, I think in 2009, also uh, proved that I think it's flows on Neil manifolds. I think, I think it's a, maybe it's a Neil Potent flow. Um, I think that those also satisfy the conjecture. There's a whole handful of things. All right. Okay. So now let's move on to interval exchange transformations. Okay. So this is where I'm going to need the color chalk. So I'm going to give the definition of an IET uh, basically by picture, because that's much more interesting. Um, and I'm going to do it for four IETs so that I don't have to generalize to lots of intervals. Okay. So this is going to be for a four IET. Okay. We're going to have an alphabet on four letters, A, B, C, D. This is our alphabet. All right, um, we're going to let I sub alpha, or alpha is in our alphabet, be a partition. So this is a partition of the unit interval. Okay. Um, lambda sub alpha is going to be the length of that interval. All right, and then before I draw you a picture of the map, we'll also need a permutation, which we'll call pi which is made up of two permutations, uh, pi t and pi b. They're top and bottom when you write the permutation. OK, so now what is the IET? Right. So t is a map from 0 to 1 back into 0, 1, defined by, OK, and I'm going to draw it for one particular permutation. So I'm going to assume here that my permutation is A, B, C, D goes to D, C, B, A. Okay. It's a perfectly valid one, right? Okay. Have you seen a lot of IETs in the seminar? No, OK. I wasn't sure. I guess JIDEV left, so <laughs> not a lot of IETs. OK. Um, so let this be A. B, maybe C and D. 
Okay, so those are our intervals, and what we're going to do is just rearrange them according to the permutation. Okay, so they were in this order. Now D is going to come first, which is like this long, and then C, and then B, and then A. So this is our map T. All right, so it's piecewise linear, piecewise isometry of the unit interval. It has you know, a handful of discontinuities, okay? That preserves the bank measure, okay? So that's what an interval exchange transformation is. All right. And they have lots of very nice properties that you can study. Okay. For the rest of this talk, we're gonna talk about three IETs. So we're gonna be doing two intervals when we start getting into actually doing stuff, okay? Um, just as a remark, if you were to have two intervals here, okay, there's one permutation, you just switch them, right? And that's the rotation of the circle, okay? Okay, so they're one way to generalize rotations of the circle. Okay. The next thing that I need to tell you about is Rosy induction, okay? Yeah, so I wasn't sure if I needed to talk about this part or not, but it sounds like I should talk about this. Okay, all right, so this is an induction scheme. Um, and so by an induced map, you're just looking at, you're taking a sub-interval or sub-part of your space, and you're looking at the first return um, to that, that set, right? And that's a new map, okay? So Rosy induction is a very particular kind of induction scheme okay, for IETs. So we'll do it for this IET that we've drawn here, or this permutation. Okay, and there's two rules for using the Rosy induction, and it depends on um, when you look at T, or the interval and the image of the interval, it depends on this last part, which one's bigger. Okay, so we'll draw uh, both pictures. Okay, all right, so. For the first part, let's assume, um, oh, so let's do this with three. It's a little easier with three. Okay, let's assume that our last interval is big, really big. Okay, so maybe. Okay, so when T gets mapped here, um, C is the really big one here, and then B. And then A, all right? So what we do is we take the smaller portion and we chop that off. Okay, it's blue. Okay, and we're gonna be looking at the first return to this interval here. Okay, so now let's draw the new uh, in induction map, or return map. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna have a map on this shorter interval. Right. Um, our labeling at the top is going to stay the same. So C is just a little bit shorter, right? And then uh, where do things get mapped? Well, B still goes here because it's in the right interval, right? So B still goes here. Okay. Um, this part of C still exists, right? Which gets mapped to this first part. And what about A? Where does it go? Well, it went here, all right, which is here and gets mapped to here. So it's the first time it returns to this part of the interval. Okay. So if this was T, then this is say T prime. Okay. So that's how Rosy induction works. Um, a couple of notes on this. This is called a top procedure because C was bigger. Um, C is the winner. So here, C is our winner because it got to stick around, all right? We have a new IET, and our new IET, our permutation, we'll call it pi prime, is ABC, goes to CAB. Okay, that's our new permutation, all right? And you notice it's a top procedure, and the top part stayed the same in the labeling. So and in what sense is C, when I mean, they all stayed around? Well, C got to stay the same in its labeling. 
see how these, um, the bottom, so you can think about it as the bottom being relabeled, but a part, since a part of C actually remained here, um, the top label stayed the same. I mean, you could call it whatever you like, yeah. but uh, I think that's the idea between behind why it's the winner. It didn't get chopped off completely, right? Okay, and um, the important part is that there's a substitution that goes with this induction. Okay, and it's on the three letters, A, B, and C. Okay, so where is it gonna go? Well, when you wanna figure out what the substitution is doing, you're following itineraries and seeing where things land. Okay, so what you wanna do is you want to, so this is I prime, this is I. Okay, you wanna follow the images of elements of I prime, so these guys, right? under the original map T until they return to I. Okay, so let's, let's see what happens, right? Okay, so um, A, where does it go up here? Well, it starts out, this interval starts out in A. It goes here, which is really part of C, and then it would map here, so it returned to I prime. So where did it go? Well, it went to A and then C before it returned. Okay, this one here, B. We start off B, and we immediately map to I prime. So it just stayed by itself. Okay. C, the same way. This part of C started off in C in this labeling and immediately got mapped down to I prime. Yeah. All right. So I went through that a little bit carefully um, because this part confuses people sometimes. All right. So this is our, our substitution uh, that goes with this. Then there's uh, the bottom procedure, where A is going to be the winner. Okay. So this is actually the easier one. This is why you do this one second. Okay. So C is going to be really small. Okay. So now, again, this is T. I, C goes first, and then B, and then A. So the smaller one gets uh, chopped off. So the smaller one this time is C, so we say A is the winner. Okay, and we look at our induced map to this interval here. Okay, and so this one, uh, things get a little relabeled at the top a little bit, right? Okay, so where do things go? Um, well, this part of A is what stays the same, so that's what roughly like here. So this beginning part of A goes to here, right? Um, all of B gets sent to here, right? And this other little tiny end of A got mapped here, which was C, which got mapped to the front. Okay, so here. So that's how we do our labeling, all right? And this is our induced map, T prime on I prime, okay? Again, this is a bottom procedure and our new IET is ACB goes to AB. Oh, did I label that wrong? I did. Um, this is C, right? Yeah. ACB goes to CBA. You let me label it wrong. <laughs> okay, and then our substitution so now well, where does A go? Well it stays in A the whole time and immediately returns to I prime. This B here is here, it's in the it starts in B and it immediately goes back to I prime. And C is the one that got chopped off. So this little part of C. It starts off in A, moves here, and goes to C before it returns. Okay. So that's our substitution. All right. So this is rosy induction, and you can make what's called a rosy diagram. Okay. And this may seem completely unrelated to what we started off talking about, um, but it's all going to come back 
Because the title of the talk was Self-Similar Interval Exchange Transformations, right? OK. And so the big overall thing is that I'm trying to get to self-similar interval exchange transformations. It's a special class of these maps, all right? And those satisfy our next conjecture. That's what we're getting to. And we're going to do that via joinings. <laughs> okay. So what is a rosy diagram? Okay. So again, we're doing this for three because it's so much easier and smaller. I can actually draw it <laughs> on the board well. Okay. So the um, vertices in the diagram or graph are permutations, possible permutations for three IETs, right? And the edges are going to be labeled by winners. So if you start with this permutation, which is what we started with over there, and you see A is your winner, right? Then the permutation that you wind up with, as we saw, was ACB goes to CBA. So that's how this diagram works, OK? Um, and then I can fill in the rest of it. Okay. Um, here, if we did this and we had C as our winner, what do we go to? Um, a, B, C goes to what? C, A, B. So that's how the diagram works. All right, when we talk about um, three IETs and we start inducing, um, you can follow the permutations by here. You start here, you want to do one scheme of induction, it gets you here. You can do another scheme of induction, maybe it takes you back to this, and you can keep going through the diagram. Um, this is always the starting point, I would think, if you want to do an interesting 3 IET, because if you'll notice, these other ones are actually rotations in disguise, right? If you were to lump AB together, this would be a 2 IET, right? Or you could lump CB together, and this would really be a 2 IET. So this is the interesting one. OK. So now, self-similar, what does that mean? All right, because that was in our title. OK. So I'm going to say it in a way that makes sense, and then I'll write down the actual definition. OK. So um, the way that you think about it is you start with an IET. Say so you start here in the middle. And what you want to do is you want to follow a loop in this graph, in this diagram. So a loop, so you do something and then you come back, right? Um, and that's going to define a self-similar IET, all right, from the diagram perspective. What it means from the IET perspective is that you take your IET and you induce, right? So you get a shorter IET and then you induce again, you induce again, and at some point, you end up with a tiny IET, and you rescale it back up to the unit interval, and it's the exact same IET. Okay? So you induce a finite number of times and rescale, and you wind up right where you started. Okay? These are also, I think, pseudo and Ossoff flows, if you want to think about them that way. All right. So in terms of the diagram, you can write it down with matrices. Right? So this is an IET. We have a permutation and a length vector. That's all you need to define one of these IETs. So pi lambda is self-similar if, say, there exists a loop in the rosy diagram. And an associated uh, perone frobenius matrix M, we'll call it M, such that M uh, psi equals um, psi lambda. Oh, no, no, it's a lambda. <laughs> okay, uh, where psi is the dominant or the prone for Benius eigenvalue, the dominant eigenvalue. Okay, it's another way to say exactly what I just said. Where does this matrix come from? Well, remember I said there were substitutions that went with each induction process. So every time you go, you hop from one to another, um, there's a substitution that goes with this arrow, right? And you can you know, do the composite all the substitutions together until you get back to where you started. And that substitution has a matrix that goes with it. And we're going to do an example. Okay? So that's the matrix that I'm talking about here. right? 
And what's beautiful about this, I think, um, is that you can study IETs from the point of substitutions in dynamical systems, which is a whole different field of study. So these self-similar ones are exactly substitutions. Okay. All right. So let's look at the loop. Um, let's see, what do I want to do? A, B, A, C, C. All right. So again, we're starting here. This is our home base. And we're going to go this way. Then we're going to go around, back, back, and then back to our home base. That's the loop we're going to do. Okay. If you were to put all those substitutions together, the one that you come out with is A goes to A, B, A, C. B goes to A, B, B, A, C. And C goes to A, C. Okay. So in um, dynamical systems, you know, there's a realm called symbolic dynamics, and within that you can study substitution. So they're wonderful and really easy to draw pictures of, which is nice. Um, so this completely defines uh, your transformation. So it has, it's a three-letter alphabet. Um, and if you want to talk about words, you see if any. So um, a point in the space is some big, long sequence of symbols, right? And if you want to see if a point is actually in your space associated with the substitution, you take any little finite block, and you see if it comes from something like this. Um, so what is the matrix that goes with this substitution, the incidence matrix? Well, uh, we start with A, and we say, okay, it has two A's, one B, one C. And we look at B, and it has two A's, uh, two B's, and one C. C has um, one A, no B's, and one C. So that's our matrix that goes with it. Um, the eigenvalues. are 2 plus or minus root 3 and 1. Okay, And I'm going to point this out and probably not say too much about it. But the neutral eigenvector <laughs> is 1 minus 1, 1. Okay. So when you're looking at these uh, self-similar three IETs, um, no matter what loop you choose, all right, um, it always has a neutral eigenvalue. Okay, and the neutral direction, uh, the eigenvector is always this eigenvector okay, for this particular class. All right, and when you're trying to uh, prove things, depending on what you're trying to prove, this is uh, extremely useful. Okay. All right. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about some dynamics, and back to joining. So we have um, x, beta, mu, t. This is going to be our dynamical system. All right? So here, x, beta, mu is our Lebesgue probability space. And so x is our space. Mu is our probability measure. Beta is our sigma algebra of measurable sets. It's a Lebesgue probability space. So it's measured theoretically isomorphic to the unit interval with Lebesgue measure. So nice, nice space. And t is our map from x into x that's invertible and measure preserving. Okay. That's our system. All right. So with that, we have a couple of definitions. And this is where our joinings come in. So bear with me. Uh, these don't have picture definitions. So there's some ragging here. So we'll talk about a two-fold joining. So a two-fold self-joining. of our system here, x beta mu t, okay, is a measure 
defined on the product space. So defined on x cross x, right? Um, that is t cross t invariant, and whose marginals are mu. So I think these are also called couplings and probability theory. Okay. So what I mean by marginals are mu, I just mean if you project down to one of the coordinates, then you get the regular measure back. Okay. So that's a self-joining. Well, that's a two-fold self-joining, because you can see I have two things, right? You could do k self-joining, so you would have uh, k things in your cross product, you could do it that way, all right? And what does it mean for these to be minimal? Okay, well we say the system x beta mu t has minimal self-joinings, or minimal self-joinings of order two, okay, if every ergodic Two-fold self-joining. Uh, we'll call it new. Is either the product measure, right, or an off-diagonal measure? Okay. All right. So. Minimal in the sense that when you put the system together with itself and you look at the cross product and all measures, ergodic measures that are invariant under the T cross T map, that there's only the obvious ones, right? Nothing interesting sneaks in, right? So these two systems are actually pretty disjoint, right? They don't have common factors and things like that. Okay. Um, should I say what an off-diagonal measure is? Yeah, okay. Um, so um, off-diagonal measures are, we'll say, A, B. Nu of A cross B is just mu of, say, A intersect T to the I of B, something like this. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, so let me give you a theorem. And I've already wrote a big lemma on the board so that I don't have to write that down. Okay, and this is that self-similar Three IETs of minimal self joinings. Okay, and you'll notice that I only put up the definitions for twofold, all right? But again, you could put a K here, right? And you have minimal self joinings if you have self joinings, minimal self joinings of all orders. Okay, all right. So self similar three IETs have minimal self joinings. Self-similar three IETs are also uniquely ergodic. Well, we have our next conjecture, right? Okay. Um, the way that I get at these minimal self-joinings is actually through rigidity, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, but there's a theorem that says um, that three IETs either have minimal self-joinings or are rigid. These are two properties that are not compatible. Right, and they're either in one class or the other, okay? And uh, the theorem that takes the work is showing that self-similar three IETs are not rigid, okay? So then they have to have minimal self-joinings, they're uniquely ergodic, they have to satisfy our next conjecture, okay? Um, so briefly, with the last five minutes, um, I just wanted to say how you would kind of get at this minimal self-joinings if you were gonna do it directly, okay? Instead of going through rigidity. Um, because you can take it for substitution specifically, right? Because um, I feel like not that many people do it that way, 
And you can use something from Rudolph's uh, book, which is a little bit older. And I feel like it was a lost theorem. So. so the theorem, or the lemma, is over here. So this is a lemma by Dan Rudolph. It's in his uh, Dynamical Systems book. Okay. There's a lot of hypotheses. There's four hypotheses. The conclusion says that you're a product measure, which is really great. Okay. Um, so let me highlight maybe some important parts of the theorem. I mean, they're all important. But <laughs> so you take your, your ergodic system. Your PIs are just, I don't know if you can see, are cylinders generating your sigma algebra. And if you cross them, that's your sigma algebra generating the, the cross product. OK. Um, and the important, really important part, and the part you have to work at, is um, 3 and 4. Okay. So this is specifically, um, I'm going to be using this for substitutions. Right? So you have to find these. So if you, a good way to say this. Um, so a point in your space is an infinite, a bi-infinite sequence of letters, right? And so what you want to do is you want to find a large chunk of time in each of them, in the one and then where it maps to, say, um, such that a large chunk of time where you're in a cylinder set, if and only if you jump by some amount, some power, you're still in the cylinder set. So this has to happen. So you shift, and you're still in your cylinder set. And if you were to shift by one, um, you're in your set again. This is a bad way to say this. I need pictures, and I don't have these pictures. Um, I have the article up here, and I can show you pictures that are generated by a computer, which is much better, because um, this is kind of hard to say without all my pictures. Um, but basically, like I said here, this is the important part. Okay, So you shift by TK. You're still in your set, all right? You take a different point, you shift by TK plus one, you stay in your cylinder set, all right? So you're off by one, okay? And this fact that you're off by one, um, the reason you can do it for these three IETs is exactly because you have this mi one minus one, one as your neutral eigenvector that ties right back into this. Um, and I should say this is also connected to um, Ratner's theorem, I think, a little bit. Because um, she does some stuff with self-joinings. And again, it comes back to this kind of property, where you return or you a different point returns in a time plus one. OK, that was a little bit hand wavy, but I can tell you more if you want. Um, let me just say uh, two minutes. Um, one question uh, that's open is finding a 4 IET, so just one step up that has minimal self-joinings. There are no examples. Okay. Um, there is an example of a 4 IET that satisfies Sarnak's conjecture, um, but that wasn't done through joinings. All right? So just one more interval seems such so innocent, right? Just one more interval. Um, can, you, can you do this and use this theorem to show minimal self-joinings? And I have lots of examples that I've went through, and I have one candidate in mind that I think I might be able to get to work. Um, again, it comes down to this um, having a neutral eigenvalue. And so you have to find an example, I think, with a neutral eigenvalue and work through some stuff. But it's a lot harder. Um, so that would be the next thing to work on, in my opinion. Yeah. OK, I'll stop there. Yes. I didn't want that bell to go off while I was talking. <laughs> Yes, three IETs are almost all not simple. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the, I just saw um, John Chaika talk about that last month. Um, so yeah, it was a short talk though, so I didn't get a lot of details. But it was all three right. IETs are almost all non-simple. The um, they're so simple. Simplicity is related to joinings. Um, in terms of the definition, um, but it's a little bit broader than minimal self-joinings. Um, and I think what he said, again, from a 20-minute talk, so not a lot, I think what he said is that um, they prove some criteria that relates to rank one maps. Okay. So they prove, 
they goes through rank one, yeah. So they prove some criteria for simplicity in rank one maps, and then they use this criteria to show that the three IETs satisfy it. Um, so it's some, he actually used, said he used rigidity theory for rank one maps, um, which I was really excited about because one of the other projects I'm working on is characterizing rigidity for rank one maps. So it all kind of ties together. Okay. Well, I'm kidding again. <laughs>